Fenwick. Volume 2, Letter 16. From Clement Montgomery to Arthur Murden. I write again and again to you, Arthur, and you remain silent. Yet a fate so various as mine makes even communication enjoyment. Various, did I say? No, it was but my apprehensions that were various. The fate was certain, established beyond the reach of change. Mr. Valmont ever designed to make me his heir, and designs it still. Yesterday brought me a welcome letter, and a more welcome remittance. I am known to be your protector, Clement, says Mr. Valmont in his letter, and it is necessary for my honour that you should preserve a degree of consequence among men. Moreover, money is the master key to the confidence of men. Use it as such. Gratify their wants, real or artificial, and they in return will soon display the sordidness, the ingratitude of their hearts. Precious doctrines these! And Arthur, I being wiser than the sender, have dismissed them, to keep their fellow maxims company in a close shut drawer in my secretary, where they shall rest in peace until I turn snarling cynic also. But the intimation, Arthur, the cash, Arthur, I have not hoarded those in a drawer. You hear that it is necessary for Mr. Valmont's honour that I preserve consequence among men. Ah, dear sir, leave me ever thus to the support of your honour among men. I will not complain, though you preserve wholly to yourself the felicity of being locked within the walls of Valmont's castle. I yield the building and am content alone to aim at preserving your honour and dignity with the valued produce of its rich acres. This is the first time that Mr. Valmont's letter to me have failed to mention Sibella. Heaven avert the omen, if it be one. Yet surely, for Miss Ashburn advised and I commanded, surely she will be silent. Murden, twas one of the blind mistakes of fortune that Sibella and I should love each other directly in the teeth of Mr. Valmont's designs, and both so absolutely within his power. Hey ho, I have been just taking a view of her picture. What a divine face! Some day I will make another copy of this miniature. The hair, beautiful as it is, falls too forward and hides the exquisite turn of her neck. How can I endure to conceal the greater beauty and display the less? Ah, should those lips, lips promising eternal sweets, ever move to the destruction of my hopes, should they betray me to Mr. Valmont, then, Arthur, must they never again give joy to mine. For however Sibella's wild energy might inspire me, while reclined at the foot of a tree, to vow this and to promise that of fortitude and forbearance here in the centre of delights, I feel that Sibella is as much a dreamer as her uncle. A thousand wants occur that I knew not in her arms, wants which possibly her refinements might call artificial, yet to me is their gratification so endeared as to become necessary to my existence. Sooner would I quit life than live unknown and unknowing. Misled by the power of beauty, methought Sibella spoke oracles while she talked to me of contentment and independence. Whither might not the thraldom of her enslaving charms have led me, "'Twas wonderful I escaped ruin, wonderful that I had strength to persevere in opposing her intent of declaring to her uncle the secret of that contract which crowned me with happiness, while it laid the foundation of a world of fears. Could you see her, and could you taste the enticements of her caresses, you would wonder too.' Heavens, how will my happy years roll on, should I become securely the inheritor of the Valmont estates? 
for then will i reward my fairest then will i make her my wife oh that i could find some magic spell to charm her to silence to deaden in her the memory of the past so that i might peaceably enjoy the present without torturing apprehensions to assail me of mr valmont's discoveries of mr valmont's resentments but enough of the name of valmont faith murden my thoughts are never so near the castle as when i write to you and the reason is plain i fly to my pen only when a cessation from pleasure threatens me with lassitude and to such a cause i am frank enough to tell you you owe this my letter it is now one hour past noon and i went to bed at nine this morning my limbs acknowledged a most unusual portion of weariness but the gay shadows of the night's diversions flitted before me in tumultuous rotation i had moments of insensibility on my pillow but not of rest and after making a vain attempt of two hours to find sleep i rose and ordered my breakfast a thought of writing to you succeeded for tempestuous weather will not let me ride and haggard looks forbid me to visit mrs ashburn's fortune must be immense and on my soul i adore her spirit she does not suffer time to steal by her unnoticed nor wealth to sleep in her possession i believe her very dreams are occupied in forming variety of pleasures their succession is endless and perpetual yesterday and last night i made one of a brilliant crowd of visitors who thronged to mrs ashburn's her new house was purposely prepared for this occasion and no ornament that taste could devise and wealth approve was wanting to render it complete in elegant splendor a suite of rich apartments were yesterday morning thrown open for the reception of near three hundred persons it was a breakfast worthy to be recorded among the enchantments of a persian tale and every mouth was filled with applause and still would the breakfast and concert have been the universal theme had not the more novel and splendid entertainment of the evening deservedly claimed the superior praise mrs ashburn's cards had also invited the company of the morning to a masked ball for the night the masks began to assemble about eleven mrs ashburn had laid her commands on me not to appear till i judged the company would be assembled no small tribute this her command to the vanity of your friend arthur she had chosen my habit she had added to it some brilliant ornaments i will be honest enough to confess that to the utmost it displayed my advantages of person and mrs ashburn believed the effect of the whole would be striking i represented a winged mercury my habit of pale blue satin was fastened close around me with loops buttons and tassels of orient pearls these amounting to a value i dare hardly guess at mrs ashburn absolutely forced upon me for the occasion thus resplendent i joined the throng buzzing whispers of the mercury the mercury splendid charming etc etc ran round the walls but if the mercury excited their astonishment his own surprise and delight was doubly triply excited by the enchantments which seemed to take his senses prisoner methought in the morning i had quitted a palace what name then could i devise to express the fanciful grandeur of the present scene everything was new such dispositions had been made that the form of the apartments appeared changed how the pillars lights music refreshments were disposed you may amuse yourself if taste will so far aid you in imagining 
as for me i have no power of description my brain whirls from one dazzling object to another and leaves me but an indistinct crowded recollection of the various beauties mrs ashburn was unmasked janetta londy had shone a bright star of the morning but what cloud had now dimmed her rays i could not with the best of my endeavours discover i detected the duchess de d and essayed to gain some tidings of the recreant star but she laughed me off without a tittle of information suddenly the bands of music make an abrupt pause every one looks round silent and surprised a pair of folding doors fly open streams of light burst upon the eye the rich perfumes of the east pour forth their fragrance to the sense the altar of taste appears raised like a throne at the upper end of the temple rows of silvered cupids present offerings and point to the goddess who presides at her own altar i knew her form well twas worthy of the goddess her robe fell gracefully behind loose from her shape which a white vest sprinkled with golden stars admirably fitted her plumes waved high over a coronet of budding myrtle and the half-blown rose her cestus glittered of the diamond diamond clasps confined the fullness of her robe sleeves a little above the elbow and her fine arm borrowed no ornament beyond its own inestimable fairness in short arthur who could look on unmoved twas mrs ashburn's triumph of wealth but janetta londy's uncontrollable triumph of beauty i have many times wondered by what charm janetta could arrive at such unbounded influence over her benefactress for certainly mrs ashburn has a plentiful share of vanity and is ever aiming to excite admiration how then can she forgive the youth and charms of her companion in vain janetta last night assumed a double portion of that cold haughtiness of demeanour with which she now receives my advances to familiarity she personated the goddess of taste and men would pay their loud and daring homage to the divinity mrs ashburn became piqued she spoke pettishly to janetta and endeavoured to disperse her admirers at length she beckoned me from a distant seat to which i had retired somewhat fatigued and dispirited and delivered the goddess to my protection we danced together we did not separate during the rest of the entertainment this is as it used to be whispered the duchess d n coming up to the sofa on which we sat but you chevalier are so faithless added she oh said i fixing my eyes on janetta your grace misplaces that accusation i am constancy itself you ladies indeed who know the power of your charms are not to be satisfied with the homage of a single lover your insinuation sir replied janetta is easily understood and if i am happy enough to escape interruption from the company i shall take the present opportunity of freeing myself from your charges the duchess will condescend to aid me i believe mr montgomery will scarcely doubt of the testimony of the duchess d n ah replied the duchess defend me from lovers quarrels for heaven's sake my dear do you suppose that you engross all the charms of to-night and that poor i have no better employment than to shake my head look grave and bear a solemn burden to your serious speeches tell the story yourself child and if the chevalier can look on your face and mistrust you make him a gay curtsy and follow me my dear into yonder circle when the duchess was gone janetta relapsed into her reserve and had i not become extremely urgent would have deferred the explanation yes indeed arthur 
i have wronged her most shamefully in my suspicions but the story is too long for me to relate in my present record i drag through one heavy sentence after another intending that each shall be the last now having by this effort brought on an increase of weariness i'll e'en try what repose a couch will afford me and then away to mrs ashburn and janetta clement montgomery end of section thirty three